Hello everyone and welcome to today's live webinar by AISC, Effective Communication of Connection Design, presented today by Dr. Patrick J. Fortney of Save Steel. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Patrick J. Fortney, PhD and PE, Manager of Engineering and Chief Engineer of Surveys Engineering Corporation in Roswell, Georgia. Dr. Fortney has over 25 years experience in the construction industry and related areas in teaching, research, and practice. As Chief Engineer, he is responsible for all structural design performed by six steel fabrication divisions currently operated by Surveys Steel Company. He is a member of ASCE, AISC, serving on various committees for each, including the AISC Seismic Design Manual Committee, the AISC Specification Subcommittee TC6 on Steel Connections, and the Research Council on Structural Connections and its Specification Committee. Very pleased to have Dr. Fortney here today with us. Pat, welcome, and I'm going to hand things over to you. All right, thank you, Brent. And I appreciate everybody joining in for this uh, webinar. Uh, this is an important topic to me. I think it's uh, critical to the success of, of any project when um, fabricators and connection designers and engineer of records are working together to uh, have a successful project. I will, I will point out that the, um, uh, th with the time allotted, that uh, this presentation really just scratches the surface, uh, but hopefully it, uh, it's enough to uh, get some uh, future future discussion going. So with that, we'll we'll move right on to um, to the presentation. The the objectives here are it's a common practice in the steel construction industry uh, for the engineer of record to designate structural steel connection design to the fabricator's engineer. Uh, this type of arrangement requires effective communication uh, between the two. And so the objective of this discussion is to illuminate the type of information that needs to be communicated between the engineer and the, and the designer and effective ways of doing so. Now, although this practice of fabricators designing connections has been common for decades, it's just been recently that the Code of Standard Practice explicitly recognized the practice. So the 2010 version of AISC 303 or the Code of Standard Practice explicitly recognizes this and we're going to talk about that for a while here uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, for those of you who don't have a copy of the Code of Standard Practice, a link is provided there for you to go get the download. So before we get started, I'm going to ask a, a couple questions here and try to provide some answers, maybe to sort of illuminate why it's important that I'm giving, uh, I'm giving this presentation. So the first question is, why is communication of the design criteria and the EOR's expectations so critical? Uh, when the fabricator's engineer is given any portion of the design scope, uh, that needs to be clearly indicated on the design drawing. So if, if you're choosing option three, that needs to be communicated. And why it needs to be communicated, misleading, false, omitted, or even contradictory information leads to delays, errors, and ultimately uh, can cause unnecessary costs. And in some cases, those costs can be significant. Additionally, if the fabricator's engineer is required to sign and seal the work that he, that he or she is doing, that needs to be clearly indicated on the drawings also. Uh, if the fabricator is given the design scope and we need to sign and seal that work, the company's risk profile is increased. If we're signing and sealing it, it increases even more and that kind of uh, information needs to be communicated so that the estimators can capture the costs related to that during the bid stage. The next question is why is coordination of the information on the design document so critical? Again, contradictory, incorrect or, incorrect or omitted information can lead to inaccurate estimates during the bid stage and oftentimes requests for clarifications that are uh, questions that need to be asked um, during the bid stage 
you, and sometimes it's very common that those aren't fully addressed prior to the bid being submitted. So any clarification not fully addressed during the estimating stage uh, has the potential for change orders after the award of the project. So that's why it's important that we communicate this uh, on the design drawings. So a comprehensive coordination of accurate information provided on the design drawings minimizes the need for, that for, for clarifications, which in turn, as you might guess, minimizes the potential for change orders during the job. Furthermore, why is communication of the design loads so critical? Well, when connections are completely designed by the SELR, that is, if the fabricator is uh, only fabricating and furnishing the steel, and the engineer is doing all 100% of the design work on the connections, any trips or problems encountered during their own design rules can be easily revised in-house to resolve issues, uh, especially related to uh, particular to connection design. However, if the SEOR is, is giving scope to the fabricator to design the connections, any trips encountered during, in the design rules encountered during that time can be problematic to the fabricator in regard to decision making. So any connection uh, designer who is stuck with impractical design rules can cause unanticipated costs that again very well could lead to, to some change orders or additional costs beyond what, the, what, was, what was estimated. And what we'll, we'll talk about this later on in the presentation, uh, UDL, uh, specifying UDL for beam end reactions uh, in specific cases can be considered an impractical design rule. Why is communication of the design loads so critical? Uh, they are anticipated costs associated with these impractical design rules. And these unanticipated costs can't be captured by the estimator during the, during the bid stage. So if the project specs and all the design documents uh, are effective, clear, and concise in the communication of the design rules, uh, and the design loads minimize these unanticipated costs. And that works out better for everyone. So with those questions being asked, uh, we'll start out with some general topics. Uh, first, we're going to take a look at the Code of Standard Practice, the 2010 version, in regard to the SCR's option for designating connection design. And we'll follow that up with uh, talking about some information that the Code of Standard Practice requires the SEOR to provide on their drawings uh, specific to connection design. Following that, we'll discuss uh, the information that the connection need design, connection designer needs to, uh, that the connection designer needs from the SER, and uh, likewise, it's a two-way street. Uh, so the uh, SER also needs uh, the connection designer to be effective in communicating their design. Uh, throughout the discussion, I'm going to provide some examples of effective communication and not so effective communication. Uh, please be aware that many of the examples or some of the conversation are taken from real projects, so it's anecdotal. Um, recognize that if you recognize a figure or you find yourself intimately involved with a particular part of the discussion, um, Please, uh, please know that uh, discretion has been taken very seriously in the proper preparation of this presentation. So who's designing the connections? So we'll talk about how the, uh, uh, the 2010 version of the Code of Standard practice uh, the options that the structural engineer has. The AISC Code of Standard practice now gives three options for designating connection design. Those options are given in Section 3.1 of the, of the Code of Standard Practice, and it starts out by saying that the owner's designated re representative for design, that is, the structural engineer of record, shall indicate one of the following options for each connection. And I have taken the liberty of boldly underlining those two final words there, each connection, as we proceed through the presentation. Uh, I believe that this is an important language, and I will refer back to the fact that it, it lists this for each connection uh, every once in a while during this presentation. So this table shows the three options now available in the 2010 version of 303. 
Option 1 is the complete connection design shall be shown in the structural design drawings. Now, when you're looking at this table, I want to be clear that the, that the information provided in the column that's headed by description is taken straight from the code of standard practice. In regard to who's designing the connections and who has the responsibility, uh, that's really that's, that's my discussion there in regard to who has the, who's designing the connections and who has the responsibility. So with option one, if the structural engineer of record is designing all the connections, then clearly the SEOR has the design responsibility for those connections and also has the responsibility for the integrity of the connections. Option 2 reads, in the structural design drawings or specifications, the connection design shall be designated to be selected or completed by an experienced steel detailer. And note that, note that it does not say that the connection shall be designed by an experienced detailer. It's only selected or completed. So in this regard, when you use this option, you do not want to put a detailer in a position where they have to make engineering decisions. Now under this option, the SEOR is responsible for the design of those connections and it also has the, uh, the responsibility for the integrity of the connection. It's this option 3 that's new in the 2010 version and it reads, in the structural design drawings or specifications, the connection design shall be designated to be designed by a licensed professional engineer working for the fabricator. Now in this case, the code of standard practice uses the language that the professional engineer is going to design the connections. So the fabricator's professional engineer is designing those connections. The question that comes up a lot when I give this presentation is who has the responsibility for the integrity of that connection? Well, in my opinion, uh, the SEOR has basically brought in another engineer to be a member of their team. And so, you know, the, the responsibility is really shared. Now, there is some delicate legal questions uh, that have to be uh, addressed in this regard. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't answer those kinds of questions. Um, so I, I'm not going to hold any discussion in regard to the legalities of the responsibility. Uh, and the structural design drawings and specifications, uh, this option three, uh, in my experience, this really comes in two general forms. The first form were, would be where the, the fabricator's engineer is just asked to design the connections. So the, the connections are prepared by a licensed professional engineer. The second form is when the, when the fabricator's engineer is designing the connections is that in addition to being asked to design the connections, they're also asked to sign and seal their work. And there, those really are two distinct uh, forms of, the, of, the, um, uh, of, the, of this option. So be aware of that. If you want the engineer to, to sign and seal their work, it should be made clear. And I'd like to talk about that now. Under option three, uh, how the EOR specifies the fabricator's uh, scope. So here's an example taken from the uh, general notes of a project. I have highlighted here in this first sentence, all connections except for those connections completely designed on the drawings. Now I have this highlighted. One, it, um, it is opening up uh, and, and, and implying that the fabricator has some scope in regard to connection design, but it also implies that there are some connections that have been completely designed. And if you remember in option three where it leads in, it says that each connection, that the three options have to be chosen for each connection. Very rarely does the SEOR actually identify which connections they feel have been completely designed. And we'll look at an example of that later on. This finally goes on to say that the contractor shall submit engineering calculations and connection detail drawings for each connection type, member size, and reaction indicated on the drawings. And then finally goes on to say that the design calculations shall be prepared and sealed by a qualified professional engineer. So if the engineer of records expectations was that the fabricator was going to design the connection and then sign and seal their work 
then this is, I would consider to be an effective way of communicating that desire. Here's another example in regard to shop drawings. Now those of you who are familiar with this, with using option 3, you know that fabricators provide design calculations, but they also provide shop drawings, and they're two distinct different things. So here's an example from another project where it's talking about shop drawings. And if you look at note 7, note 7 reads, that for structural steel connections indicated to comply with design loads include structural analysis data signed and sealed by the qualified professional engineer. Now at this particular job, this was not interpreted as shop drawings having to be signed and sealed. This was interpreted as uh, that the calculations that were used to generate the shop drawings were required to be signed and sealed. It turned out that the, uh, this particular project, the engineer wanted the shop drawings signed and sealed. So I would consider this not to be an effective way of communicating that desire. So if you want shop drawings signed and sealed in addition to the engineering calculations, um, we really need to be clear about that so that we, we know what's expected when we're looking at this during the estimating stage. Here's another example. Submit check shop drawings prepared by a licensed professional engineer for approval prior to the submittal. Now if you read through this, this is just suggesting that the that check shop drawings have to be submitted and that there are no signing and sealing requirements. This is another example where it basically just directs the fabricator that the shop and erection drawings have to be submitted to the structural engineer. So if Signing and sealing these shop drawings is not desired, then this would be an effective way of, of communicating that. However, if it, the desire is that the shop drawings be signed and sealed, then this would not be an effective way of, 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 of communicating that. It needs to be clear. So neither of these uh, require the calculations to be signed and sealed. If that's something that you desire, it needs to be said explicitly. Another example here, all connections shall be designed by and all drawings shall be prepared under supervision of a professional engineer licensed in the state that this, this project is being built. And then goes on to say that calculations shall have one set sealed and signed by the engineer. And then finally requires shop drawings uh, signed and sealed by the professional engineer. So this is a very effective way of communicating to the fabricator that one, the fabricator has scope in the design of the connections, that their work has to be signed and sealed, and then furthermore, the shop drawings that were prepared from those calculations have to be signed and sealed. So a, fa a fabricator can accurately capture uh, the, uh, the cost that would be associated with this type of contract. Because I have a, a slide here that just has a, a few pieces of advice for specifying the fabricator's scope. So in the project specifications and with notes on the design drawings, so if you, if you broach this subject in both the specifications and the design drawings, make sure it's coordinated and clearly state that you are or are not designating the fabricator's engineer as the connection designer. Clearly state whether or not you require the fabricator's engineer to sign and seal the calculations. <coughs> and it's common practice to submit sample design calculations for each type of uh, connection. It has happened in the past, though, that we've found out after a job that for some reason you require calculations for every connection. And now, although I'm not promoting this type of requirement, and uh, I have a couple slides to talk about uh, why I'm not promoting this. But if for some reason it's something that you desire, be clear in your specifications and general notes that that's something that you want. Clearly state whether or not you require the fabricator's engineer to sign and seal the shop drawing. So what I'm advising you to do here is to actually make a distinction between design calculations and shop drawings and be clear about what exactly your expectations are for both. And then clearly identify which connections are in the fabricator's scope and which are not. And again, we'll see a slide that, uh, that talks about uh, how, how you might go about doing that. 
No, I, 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 on that on the previous slide, I talked about um, asking for design calculations for every connection, and that I'm not promoting that. I want to be clear and communicate with you why it's important that we know that at bid stage. Typically, what we'll do is provide charts with sample calculations, for example, for beam end shear shear connections. And we'll provide that a chart to the fabricator with a sample calculation for how one of the cells in that chart was, was determined. Right, and so what we'll do with those charts then is in effect use option two of the code of standard practice and have our detailer then select or complete a connection based on the, the charts that were generated by the by the fabricator's engineer. Document preparation and control becomes increasingly more difficult and time consuming uh, if, we're, if we're providing calculations for every connection relative to just providing sample calculations. Furthermore, customer revisions and any changes that would be uh, significant uh, uh, that, are, that affect submittals uh, that have already been reviewed by the EOR becomes much more problematic. And just the volume of paperwork required to be submitted to the SEOR for review can significantly increase the time required to get through the, that design phase. And that could ultimately have an impact on shop and project schedules. And so the fabricator really needs to know that upfront during the bid stage if that's a requirement that you desire. Excuse me, Pat. Okay, let's move on to – yeah, Brent? Yeah, Pat, we do have one question real quick. All right. uh, does, the, does the fabricator's engineer need to be licensed in the state of the project or the state of where it's being fabricated? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, for sure, the, engineer, the fabricator's engineer needs to be licensed in the state that the project is being built. Um, that's most important. I don't, uh, I don't know that there would be a requirement for uh, to be licensed in a state where they're, where they're actually working, although there are some other legal issues there as far as um, certificate of authorizations and, and things like that to do business in the state that you're actually operating in. Okay. Thank you. Does that answer the question? Yes. Thanks, Pat. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Let's talk about the specifications and provisions and standards that the connection designers actually need needs to adhere to. This may seem to be something simple, um, but um, from my experience, this is something that uh, typically we run into difficulties with. So what you're looking at here is a snapshot from uh, the general notes on a, on a, on a, on a job, on a, on a real job. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, forward to the next slide. It will blow up notes four and eight. And so if we take a look at note four, note four directs us to use uh, the load and resistance factor design for structural steel buildings, the latest edition. But then when you move on to note eight, it makes reference to say that for non-composite beams that the ninth edition ASD manual needs to be used. What actually doesn't say ASD just says the ninth edition. Anybody familiar with uh, back, in the, uh, back in the day when the ninth edition was being used, that is an ASD version. So this is contradictory. Hard to uh, really understand what the engineer's expectations are. So. Um, uh, this is obviously going to be a need for clarification at this stage and certainly would be an RFI during the design phase. So I've, I've put some examples together here um, to sort of illustrate how you might want to write this up. Uh, so for example, let's say that we have a project that doesn't have any requirements for the connection designer to be using A3, AIC 341 or seismic requirements which basically says structural steel connection shall be in accordance with AISC 36005 following the ASD design methodology. So I'm being told uh, to use 360, use the 2005 version, and I'm, and I'm using an AISD, ASD design methodology. All loads provided on drawings are factored ASD loads. So now I know that I'm not dealing with service loads, I'm dealing with factored loads. 
And it goes on to say that all members labeled as, as the seismic force resisting system shall be designed in accordance with AISC 36005. And then further goes on to direct me to tell me that for bolted connections in addition to 360, I need to adhere to the 2004 version of uh, the RCFC. And that for welded connections, I need to adhere to AWSD 1.1 2004. So that's clear, to, that's clear to the connection designer what standards and specifications they need to adhere to. And this really needs to be consistent throughout, the, uh, throughout your design documents. Another example here for, uh, let's say that we were in a seismic region and 341 requirements are, are required. Structural steel connections shall be in accordance with AISC 360 2010 following the LRFD design methodology. All loads provided on drawings are factored LRFD loads. And all members labeled as seismic force resisting systems shall be designed in accordance with the 2010 version of AIC 341. Furthermore, all moment connections labeled as special moment frames shall be designed in accordance with AISC 358 2010. So I'm being told that I need to adhere for, for your typical connections for AISC 360 using LRFD that all the loads posted are factored LRFD loads, and that for the seismic force resisting system, those connections need to be in accordance with uh, 34110. And then if I have any pre-qualified moment connections that have to be designed, those need to be designed in accordance with the pre-qualified uh, spec 358. And then further goes on to direct me to uh, in addition that bolted connections have to satisfy the requirements of RCSC 2009 and that all welded connections shall be in accordance with AWS D1.1 and D1.8 2010. And again, this needs to be consistent through the design documents. So the, the, these last two slides, you can, you can put those together uh, in, in any form that you want as long as the information that you're providing is clear and consistent. So talking about the in the project specs and in the, in the design documents, let's talk a little bit about coordinating project specifications and general notes in your design drawings. So I'm going to show you a couple examples here that can uh, it, it sort of trip up a, a fabricator's estimating department or trip up a fabricator's engineer when they go to design the connections. So what you see here is a, is a snapshot from the seismic design criteria and the general notes of a, of a particular job. I have underlined there that they have an R factor of 3.0, and then in parentheses it says ordinary concentric braced frames. So anyone familiar with seismic design would know that, a, um, that an R equal 3.0 is, is usually a, a steel structure not, not specifically detailed for seismic resistance, and that an ordinary concentric braced frame has an R value larger than 3. And so that's confusing. And then as you start to go through the drawings, what you find is that you run into details like this. this is, these details really are from the same project that contain these design, this design criteria. If you look closely at these details, you'll see that there's a 2T clearance being provided here. And there's a lot of additional detailing going on in these connections, which leads one to believe that these are details for a special concentrically braced frame. So I think everyone can understand how confusing this would be to, a, to an estimator, and it certainly would be confusing to someone getting ready to start designing brace connections. In this particular job, as it turned out, that the, the job was an R equal 3. It was in a steel system not specifically detailed for seismic resistance, and that these details shown on the drawings were from another project that accidentally got put on this, draw, on, on this particular project. So it's important that general notes and details are, are coordinated and consistent. Now here's another example where, taken from a real job where the response modification factor is given as 3, and, but, but there's really no um, description for the lateral force resisting system. So as you start to, draw to, to, uh, to uh, pour through the design drawings, you would expect to see typical details. On this particular project, what we came up with, uh, we ran into these details where on the left it's showing uh, reduced beam sections, which is a pre-qualified IMF connection. 
And on the right, it's showing details for a bolted flange plate pre-qualified intermediate moment connection. Now, I know you can't read the details, and it's really not important for you to read the details. The point that I'm making here is I'm seeing connections that aren't consistent with an R equal 3. As it turned out, this particular project, the, the seismic detailing that was being asked for was, was actually uh, because uh, as a result of some progressive collapse requirements, uh, which is fine. Um, this is starting to happen, uh, become more and more common in that uh, we're seeing more and more progressive collapse analysis being done and seismic detailing be, being used for that reason. And so what I would suggest is that if you're doing that using an R equal 3 but using uh, seismic detailing for progressive collapse reasons, simply state that in your general notes so that um, so that the fabricators uh, estimating department and engineers can at least understand why they're seeing what they're seeing. Again, if you recall, the, um, some of these specs will read that for, for all connections not completely designed by the, um, by the engineer of record. And so I'm going to talk here for a couple slides about whether or not it's EM or not. So let's go back to this, uh, this note that we've already looked at before. It says, all connections except for those connections completely designed. We really need to know which connections the engineer of record considers to be completely designed and which are not. So that helps to define the fabricator's design scope. So here's an example of a, of a particular connection. If you take a close look at this, this first looks like the brace to gusset connection has been completely designed by the EOR. Uh, I know you can't read those details, but this tells you how many bolts, what size bolt, uh, what size plate to, to use. The gusset to beam interface, it tells you how long that interface needs to be, what the required weld size is. But then there's notes here that say that the engineer needs to, that the fabricator's engineer needs to design the beam to column and gusset to column connections. So this is an incomplete detail, and anyone familiar with vertical brace design knows that uh, you know that you, you need to come up with a set of forces that works for everything, and it would be hard to design these beam to column and gusset to column connections. Uh, without probably redesigning the gusset to uh, the brace to gusset and the gusset to, um, gusset to beam. So either provide a concept sketch or fully design the, the connection. In this particular case, the engineer uh, considered this to be a, an engineer mandated design, although I, we weren't really sure how to, how to detail the beam to column and gusset to column connections. Excuse me, Pat. Yes. Can you just clarify for the audience the acronym EM? What does that stand for? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, EM, engineer mandated. It's sort of a, a friendly term that the fabricators and connection designers use. Uh, if we're looking at a detail that's 100% uh, designed and all a fabricator has to do is, fabric, is detail, fabricate, and furnish, we consider that engineer mandated. So there's, uh, that's not in the scope of the fabricator's uh, design. Thank you. So the next couple of slides, uh, we had a job just a couple months ago come in uh, where uh, the engineer did a very good job of, of communicating exactly what was not in the scope of the, of the fabricator's uh, designer and, and what was. So if we take a look at uh, 1.3, this actually comes from the project specifications of this job. It talks about the performance uh, uh, requirements for the connections. It says, provide details of simple shear connections required by the contract drawings to be selected or completed by the structural steel fabricator. So if you recognize that terminology, that reads just like option two of the 2010 version of the Code of Standard Practice. So it's basically saying that these simple shear connections have been fully designed and we're just going to select what the engineer has provided based on a, on a given load. Then when you go to the notes in the, in, the, uh, in the detail drawings, this note FC2 reads, all connections unless indicated as being fully designed on the structural drawings shall be designed in detail by a licensed 
pro uh, professional engineer. And so when I, I re recall that when I started reading through this, I thought, okay, here we go. Um, uh, unless indicated as being fully designed, we're going to have to figure out what that means. But then as you read through the documents, there were further notes saying that except for specifically noted, details on the series S40 through S7 series drawings are considered completely designed and shall not be modified without specific written approval. So the engineer did a very good job of, of communicating exactly what was not in the scope of the fabricator's engineer. So the connection details shown on S10 through the S7 series was not in the scope of, our, uh, of, the, of the fabricator and just needed to be detailed and furnished. So I thought, I, I was a, thought that was a very effective way of communicating the scope of, uh, of the design for the fabricator. When you do provide concept details, um, obviously that's okay. Uh, you, have to, um, you have to give us some idea of what you think this is going to look like. Uh, what I would do is suggest though is that um, you identify critical connection geometry, identify the, the extent of the connection designer scope as we spoke about, sufficiently communicate connection design forces on the drawings, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on. And then avoid details that contain meaningless constraints that uh, needlessly limit the possible design options whenever possible. Now the AISC Code of Standard Practice requires the following information to be provided in this regard, and we'll take a look at this. So this is not a comprehensive list of what's uh, required in Section 3.1. Uh, it's just a, it's a, a, a sort of a potpourri of what I, I thought would be important. I've underlined a couple things here that I'll point out. The code of standard practice does require that when you have built up members that the engineer communicate how those members are to be joined. The, the code of standard practice also requires the engineer to identify where column stiffeners and continuity plates or where column web doublers are required. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail later on also. And then goes on to talk about bearing stiffeners and web reinforcement. And then data concerning loads, including shears, moments, axial forces, and transfer forces, which when, when, uh, when you guys registered for this, probably thought that this discussion was going to be 100% about loads. And so we'll talk about loads here a little later on. Then one of the things I find very important is if you have any restrictions in regard to the types of connections that are permitted to be used, please communicate that. Uh, if for some reason you don't like one-sided connections, be clear about that in your design drawings so that the fabricator knows to exclude those when preparing their, their pre-plan, if you will, for, for estimating. Um, Finding out that you do not want one-sided connections on the project after detailing a significant amount of design and detailing has been done is probably not the right time to do that. Uh, that can uh, usually wind up to be um, to, to have a, a fairly significant cost associated with it. All right. So welding requirements. I only have a few slides in regard to welding requirements. Um, this is again something that uh, we could probably do an eight-hour seminar on. I'm just going to give you a couple slides here to talk about. Um, so here's a here's a detail from a, from a project. Uh, this detail was actually provided by a by a colleague. I thought it was a good one, and I included it in here. So this shows a um, this shows a, an angle uh, uh, using being used to connect a, a support beam to a supporting beam uh, to a supporting beam. And it shows a fillet weld uh, at, the, at the support flange to the angle and the supported beam flange to the angle, but doesn't give a, a fillet weld size. So what size really is required here? Uh, maybe it's AISC minimum welds, or is there a specific load that needs to be transferred? Now, on some projects, the engineer will have a note in their general notes that state that where a fillet weld symbol is shown and no weld, fillet weld size provided, use an AISC minimum weld. 
So if that was the case, if we had a general note that read like that for this, we'd know what to do. But if there's no, no, no note directing us on how to handle that, then we're going to be writing RFIs to try and find out how to size that weld properly. So here we have a detail where we have a, a post sitting on top of a column. And the, the, um, the detail suggests that we have to provide three half inch plates underneath, underneath this, uh, this particular connection, on, uh, I assume, on both sides of the web. However, there's really no information provided in regards to their attachment. Uh, one additional thing interesting about this detail is note that the stiffener drops all the way down to the bottom flange, and typically we would hold that off and just drag the load into the web. But there's no attachment uh, details being shown here. So how do we attach the beam web and the flanges? So again, do we use minimum fillet welds, or maybe there's a, uh, a particular load that this weld needs to be sized for? Uh, this detail certainly doesn't suggest either one of them or, or how to go about doing that. So I think to, to, to uh, communicate exactly what you want here is either provide the required weld size and the type, or provide the required load so that the weld size and type can be determined by the connection designer. But I will ask you this, if you use option two, if we know what the load is, um, would it be okay for the connection designer to actually evaluate whether the stiffener is required or not? Uh, that's an interesting question um, that I usually wind up uh, having discussions with on projects with engineers of record in, in this regard. Um, but if you want stiffeners and uh, and you know you want to have them, then I, you, we really need to know how you want those stiffeners attached. In 2008, AWS redefined the groove weld symbol. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, the majority of you are aware of that. If you're not, um, it's something that uh, you might want to look into. So what I'm showing here is a single groove uh, weld angle, uh, weld symbol uh, with no tail note. Now prior to 2008, this, this symbol meant that there was a complete joint penetration weld required there. However, in 2008, 2008 actually AWSD 1.1 requires a CJP tail note if that's what, uh, if that's what you're desiring. So be careful what you put on. Without the CJT tail note, tail note what the engineer or the connection designer could possibly do is uh, just design a weld so that the base material is developed in tension and shear. So make sure that you're getting what you want when you communicate through your weld symbols. Uh, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to go through this, but I did provide a slide that shows the article from the 2008 AWSD 1.1 that uh, describes this new definition. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you may want to consult your 2008 version and, um, and investigate that yourself. Okay, probably what uh, most of you joined in for was a um, uh, discussion in regard to design loads. Uh, moments, transfer forces, etc. Uh, the SER should provide all forces necessary to complete the connection design accurately and economically. And if you recall, AISC Code of Standard Practice requires that to, to, be, to, be, to be done. So let's start out by talking about shear connections, simple shear connections. I have a photo here of, uh, of uh, the results of, of what I have labeled there, that darn UDL. Um, I'm not a big fan of UDL. Uh, let's talk about what UDL means. Um, what connection designers would prefer is to get the actual shears that we need to design these connections for. So here's the partial floor plan from a particular project. Um, I have the, um, the notes related to how, to how to get the design forces for the beam end reactions. I'm going to blow those notes up here. Um, the direction basically tells us that for non-composite beams to use as the, the reaction due to a full UDL loading, and for composite beams, use a reaction due to 160% of the full UDL. All right, so that's the design criteria for these beam end reactions. So uh, I'm going to 
throw some numbers out onto an AutoCAD drawing that I made of this to try and uh, communicate uh, maybe what kind of sense this UDL makes. So these red values here that you see on the screen are the values pulled out for, uh, from uh, Table 3.6 uh, of, of the 13th edition I, um, uh, for each one of the beams. The girders are composite. The infill beams are non-composite. And so for girder 1 and girder 2, we have UDL reactions of 75 kips and 147 kips. And then 22 and 48 kips for the infill beams. These blue values basically track the infill beam connection strengths to the, to, the, uh, um, to the column connection of their support beams. And so for example, if we look at this, at this interior girder here, we'll see that uh, the, the connections of these infill beams have a capacity to transfer 70 kips to that end connection. But the UDL requirement requires a connection to be transferred of 147 kips. Now maybe it's possible that there's some type of concentrated load sitting on this beam that requires that. But if the engineer knows that, that kind of actual load can be communicated. But certainly it doesn't make any sense to provide a connection capacity for 147 kips when the infill beams that are transferring that load to that girder are only good for 70. So if we take a look at what those UDL loads are and we back calculate a floor load, for girder 1 and girder 2, you can back calculate an equivalent floor load of 710 or 516 pounds per square foot. Now, this was a, a partial floor plan from a commercial building. Um, it's possible, but I think it's highly unlikely that this commercial building floor load approached you know, 700 pounds per square foot. Like I said, it's possible but unlikely. And uh, I'm going to show a couple more slides in regard to this. I've been told when I've presented this before that using the, the sort of rectangular tributary area, uh, sort of like the, you know, the KL factor when looking at this, is not appropriate to, uh, to back calculate these. So I'm going to take a look at, at a more detailed tributary area. So these triangular, triangular shapes here represent the theoretical tributary area for the girders and then for the infill beams. And so if I then back calculate the equivalent floor load using that theoretical tributary area, for example, for this spandrel here, this blue section, I'd get a floor load of 947 pounds per square foot. Similarly, for the interior girder, the, the yellow region here, I get a, a equivalent floor load of 709 pounds per square foot. So looking at this in a more theoretical way, it's actually uh, the, the floor loads are significantly larger than just using that sort of KL look at, um, at, um, at tributary area. So in that regard, uh, uh, Using UDL usually is probably very conservative and likely to drive the cost of steel construction up unnecessarily. Here's another example of UDL. If we take a look at this HSS 12 by 8, um, on this particular job, what we're required to do is provide a connection good for the posted load and that where no posted load was provided that the connection should be good for a reaction of one and a half UDL. In the case of this W16 by 26, that would be 62 kips. And so if we look at the, the beam that's supporting that W16, the total load that that's good for for the shear connections is 30 kips. But yet we're being asked to provide a connection here of this W16 of 62 kips. And in fact, that's a, in the end, that's what wound up having to be done. So, to me, that, uh, that seems a little over conservative. Now, if for some reason you can't provide the actual loads, uh, one thing that uh, several engineering firms do is what they'll do is they'll provide a, a table uh, in their general notes that says for a particular beam size, provide a reaction that's good for a certain load except for posted. So for example, on this partial floor plan here, we'll see that uh, if we have this W16 by 31 here, there's no load posted. So for this W16, we provide a connection that's good for 60 kips. If we look at the W27 here, 
The table would suggest that we have to provide a connection that's good for 120 kits. However, they have a posted load here that's larger than that, and so they're wanting a connection that's larger than what's provided in that table of 180 kits. Now, although we don't get all the all the actual loads, uh, it's it's still a little less conservative than what UDL may be. So this is maybe an option that you may want to investigate. Of course, that's when you can't provide the actual loads. Okay, let's move on to moment connections. Now, if you recall, AISC Code of Standard Practice requires the engineer to uh, communicate where continuity plates or web doubler plates or what some people call stiffener plates are required. In regard to evaluating the panel zone, let's take a look at what the, what the connection designer is really asked to do here. So, this, uh, this image here is an image taken out of AISC's 14th edition uh, J106 for web panel zone uh, evaluations. If you, those of you familiar know that there's really four different equations that can be used to compare the, the panel zone strength. So for a proper panel zone evaluation, the designer needs to know if the engineer has considered the effect on panel zone deformation on frame stability if that's been considered in their design. Whether or not we're going to use J10-9 or J10-10 or be uh, J10-11 or J10-12. And only the engineer of record knows that. Furthermore, for, the, uh, for a proper evaluation, the designer has to compute the axial capacity of the column. Uh, there's a PC term in here. And so the, engine, the connection designer would have to make an assumption about the, 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 the K value, which is usually a, a point of a discussion between connection designers and engineers. And so to do this properly, uh, you know, a, real, a considerable amount of design time uh, has to be uh, put in to make an estimate on where these, where these, uh, where these uh, continuity or what panels what, web the double plates are required. And that's, that amount of time usually is not available to, to the fabricator during the estimating stage. And so by not providing us where continuity plates or web double plates are actually required uh, can really lead to, uh, to an inaccurate uh, estimate during the bid stage. Right, so this, among other considerations, is why the Code of Standard Practice requires the SCOR to, um, to provide this information. Uh, I can make a similar discussion in regard to the continuity plates or stiffener plates, however you want to call them. So if we take a look at this slide here, this, uh, this shows basically four different cases that we, we, we maybe uh, have to deal with when we're looking at, uh, at moment connections. Basically what you're seeing is one-sided connections or two-sided connections, whether or not we're at the top of a column or at mid-span of a column. And depending on whether we're one-sided, two-sided, mid-span, or top, it makes a difference on how web doubler plates and continuity plates are evaluated. Additionally, the amount of lateral load and the amount of gravity load has an impact on the actual load that the panel zone is evaluated for and the load that the continuity plate is evaluated for. So by not providing that information, the connection designer is really put in a position where they have to make some assumptions that uh, nine times out of ten are not going to be correct as far as the engineer of record is concerned. So communicating these, this, this information about web doublers and continuity plates is very important for, for a fabricator in order to, to come up with an accurate estimate of the cost for those particular connections. Here's another example. On this particular job, we were asked to design for the full plastic moment capacity of, of, of the beam when coming up with the moment connections. Afterwards, uh, the, the actual loads were provided. So for example, on a W24 by 55, we designed connections for 503 kit feet. The actual value was 300 kit feet. Uh, that would make a, a fairly huge difference, a significant difference when it came to whether or not continuity plates or web doubler plates were required. A 24 by 62 here, we were asked to design for full plastic moment capacity, which is 574 kit feet. The actual load here was 540 kit feet. 
Now that may not seem like a lot of difference, but believe it or not, that little bit can mean the difference between having to provide continuity plates or web doubler plates. And continuity plates and web doubler plates increase the cost of a mobile connection significantly. Furthermore, it causes uh, it can have the potential of causing some uh, integrity problems. Here's an example of a 14 by 90 column that needed a one and a half inch thick continuity plate welded into it. And you can see the deformation or distortion uh, that the column flange went through during the welding process. So what I would suggest is that um, an AIC, I believe, promotes this or has promoted in the past uh, fairly fervently is promotes clean columns. And I think that clean columns really should be a goal of all of ours and that uh, we should be careful when we are making uh, beam column uh, final selections uh, to try and eliminate wherever possible continuity and web doubler plates. Now this slide here shows the clean column software that is available for free at the AIC website. Um, so I would encourage you to try and use that. I know that the you know, uh, RAM steel actually gives you a warning when you choose a column. It tells you that a double plate or a continuity plate would be required. Uh, but whatever tool that you, you feel that you can use to try, and, to try and eliminate or try to provide as many clean columns as you can uh, really has, uh, has an impact on reducing the cost of the steel package, which is good for the steel industry in general. Excuse me, Pat. Yes, sir. I do have a question regarding uh, moment connections. Okay. For bolted moment connections, should we communicate to the fabricator that the bolts must be pretensioned, or is it implied that they will be pretensioned? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the uh, at, so, uh, you know we're always going to pretension the bolts, we don't necessarily uh, uh, design them as flip critical, but pretension them on moment connections unless for some reason the engineer of record has asked us not to. Uh, but in, in general, if the engineer wants the bolts to be pretensioned, then that should be specifically stated on the drawings. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's take a look at brace connections. Uh, I'm really only going to uh, talk about transfer forces here. Uh, obviously, I could talk about uh, vertical brace connections um, all day long. Uh, but transfer forces seems to be uh, uh, one of those things that seem to be uh, omitted on drawings, and it's really important that that is communicated. Uh, so here I'm showing uh, from a, from a real job, and uh, uh, here that where the engineer is communicating that this particular location where this brace frame is uh, is separated by by a column, that there is a transfer force of 25 kips here. So if you have transfer forces. That needs to be communicated. The connection designer is not necessarily going to recognize where a transfer force is required. So um, if, you, if you have transfer force requirements, that needs to be communicated. It may not even be recognized by the connection designer where transfer forces are required. So here, here's an example. Um, if we take a look at this upper level here where we have basically an open bay separating two brace bays, do, does some of this load need to be transferred across this beam into the next bay or not? And uh, so only the engineer of record can communicate that information. And it's, it's fairly simple to do so. Here's an example from a project. Uh, that, uh, this was a, a figure provided by a colleague. I thought it was a nice one, so I'd share it. Here is where the engineer is showing that these locations, that at this particular location, a transfer force of 15 kips is, re is required. So it's, it's, it's really all, all you need to do is just note on the elevations or the floor plans where connections, where transfer forces are required. Now, if, if, if you don't communicate the magnitude of the transfer forces, but, show the tra but, but mention in your general notes that transfer forces should be evaluated, um, I, I would suggest that you provide a very clear and concise directions on how to evaluate what the transfer force is. Uh, I'm not promoting that. I think that the transfer force magnitude should be identified, but for some reason if it can't be, at least tell us how to do it. For example, if we take a look at this joint where we have two braces below, above, left, and right, 
Uh, how would a connection designer be expected to combine these forces and then evaluate um, transfer forces? And I can tell you that um, you know I have seen a multitude of ways. I've been asked to do this a multitude of ways, each one more different than the next. Um, so uh, that com that information needs to be provided. Okay. So that closes out the discussion about loads. Um, like I said, I, can, I, could, I could speak for a couple days about that. This is really just scratching the surface. Um, but let's move on now to the design submit and approval process. Um, structural engineers, contractors, uh, fabricators, connection designers, we should all seek to establish an open lines of communication with each other and as early on in the construction phase as possible. Uh, the fabricators and the connection designers, uh, if, if we want to stray uh, from the design documents, we should seek approval for changes and concepts from the EOR prior to investing a significant amount of resources. Uh, but to those connection designers out there, I would suggest that you do enough work uh, to be confident that what you're going to propose actually works. So don't, don't only invest enough, enough time as you need to just be sure that what you're suggesting is going to work. And uh, to the EORs out there, when they do get these types of requests, um, try to have an open mind. So the fabricators and the connection designers should recognize that the SERs are less likely to approve changes regardless of the merit if they require the SER to perform additional work. Um, I have found this in my experience to be um, a, a very healthy uh, philosophy. Uh, generally, if you're going to just make a suggestion and ask the SEOR to do a bunch of work to, to validate what you want to do, uh, you're going to have problems with that and uh, as it should be. And so if you've got something that you want to do, do enough, do the work to, uh, do enough work to be sure that what you're suggesting works and that you're not putting an undue burden on the SEOR. And again, I've said this before that the SEOR on the design drawing should identify any limitations on the use of standard connection concepts. Identifying that you don't like a single-sided connection during the review process is probably too late for, for that comment to be made. And where possible, a design drawing should provide connection designers some flexibility in order to develop a connection detail that's consistent with the engineers, uh, with the fabricator's shop practices. Now, up to this point, I've talked mostly about what the SEOR needs to provide to the uh, to the connection designer. Uh, it is a two-way street, and the connection designer needs to be clear about uh, how they're communicating their designs to the SEOR. So I have, a, I have a fairly large uh, example here of a connection, a, a vertical brace connection, that, uh, somewhat complicated, not over, overly complicated, but certainly not straightforward. And so we, the connection designer needs to be clear about how they've approached their design so that the, so that the SEOR can do an appropriate review. So here's a blow up of the free body diagram that was shown in the, uh, in the, in the previous slide. So for example, with the load distribution assumed for this design, there is a 360 kip um, uh, H to B, if you will, or a shear at the gusset to beam interface. So if we come over here to the part of the calculations that's looking at the capacity of, the, of that interface, you'll see that the, a calculation has been done to calculate the capacity, and then it's compared to this 360 kips. Well, without the free body diagram, the reviewer of these calculations would not know where this 360 kips comes from. So the connection designer should provide the free body diagram for a proper evaluation. Likewise, I can say the thing about any other check that's being done here. So the, engineer, the connection designer really should uh, do whatever they can to be as clear and concise about the procedures that they followed so that uh, the reviewer uh, can can do a, an accurate job of reviewing what's being done. Likewise, when the connection designer has, um, has done their best to try and communicate what they've done, 
I think the SEOR needs to also be a, a little understanding in what they're what they're asking of the connection designer. Here's another example of a, of a connection. It's a vertical brace connection. The free body diagram is, is provided showing all the, the, uh, the assumed uh, distribution of loads. And then although you can't see this, and I understand that these details are, um, uh, you, you can't read them. Trying to enlarge them, the resolution just got really poor. So what I'm doing is I'm showing you what, this, what, this, uh, what the SOR's comment here. It says provide equations at equilibrium for these free body diagrams. Now this particular P-sheet was delayed by about two weeks because the SEOR wanted to see this information. So now I protect, it's my opinion that I think that's an unreasonable request. Um, some of you may, may, uh, may disagree with that. But the point of this particular slide is to you know, try, and, um, uh, try and be um, as thoughtful as you can when you, when you mark up the, the drawings. Okay, and again, uh, the review process is not the appropriate vehicle for, for, for confirming connection design decisions with the SEOR. If you have something that you want to do, um, make sure that you communicate that prior to doing any work. Also, when you, when you send in RFIs, uh, try to make those RFIs as clear as possible. Uh, if an SEOR receives an RFI, uh, it's possible that the question being asked uh, uh, does not uh, reflect the question intended if it's not asked uh, uh, concisely. So be clear and concise in your RFI so the SEOR knows exactly what you're what you're what you're needing help with. Uh, on the other hand, the design team, that is the SEOR, is really is responsible for answering those RFIs uh, completely and in a timely manner. So whenever possible, please try to do that. Another recommendation that I would have, and again, I know you can't read this. It's not really the intent that you can. Is that this is basically um, what we're doing here is we're mapping uh, particular P sheets. So these calls are design calculations P sheets. So for example, we have a set of calculations out that are identified as P192, and so we're mapping those connections on an elevation to show the engineer uh, exactly the, the location in that structure where that, uh, where that uh, calculation applies. Now you can be as fancy as you want or do something as simple as, as something like this, but at least try to communicate to the engineer so that he, he or she is not searching trying to figure out where this applies in the structure. I made reference to, uh, to design charts that fabricators use. Um, you know, most of you have probably seen a chart like this, which basically shows for a particular type of connection, here's how the detailer is selecting the connection to be used based on a given load. Um, if you use charts, as a connection designer, if you use charts, um, it's, uh, it's a good idea to provide a set of sample calculations to show how one of the cells on that chart was calculated so that the engineer can review that and understand how that chart was generated. Right. So we'll start to close out here. Just a couple more slides. Um, this is a team effort, and I think we need to respect each other. I had said previously that, um, that uh, when option three is used, that I believe that the SEOR really is, has brought on the, the fabricator's engineer as a member of their team. And I, I, I really do believe it's a team effort. I believe that it's as, as my job as a connection designer to try and give the, the engineer what they want. Um, and so we need to respect each other while we're doing that. Keep in mind that the SEOR, um, in my opinion, cannot shift full responsibility of the connection design to the connection designer. Uh, it is a team effort, and I think we share in that. Um, the SER may have concerns or insight to detail concepts uh, that may not be apparent to the connection designer, and I think the connection designer needs to recognize that and um, and uh, consult with the with the EOR to make sure their expectations are are, are met. Um, the SER should do enough work in establishing concepts to verify that they are constructible and work for the loads. Um, so if you have a concept of the way you want something to look, um, the, the, the SER should, should uh, put some thought into whether or not it's actual, actually constructible. 
And then uh, the SER should be willing to consider fabricator connection designer suggestions. Uh, these last two bullets really are, are it's something that I believe uh, very much. I believe that the SER is the ones that are intimate with the global response and performance objectives, and it's their structure. No one knows more about that structure than the SER. And so the connection designer needs to recognize that and um, try to um, make one of his primary goals uh, that the connections that he provides are suitable for what the engineer's expectations are. On the other hand, fabricators and connection designers bring some things to the table also. And keep in mind, we deal with steel connection design every day, and so we should be treated as a resource to the SEOR. Uh, we generally can provide valuable input and suggestions on how to simplify the construction, which in turn really reduces cost and sometimes simplifies the erection. Um, we should not be unnecessarily restricted. Um, uh, although I will say that if you do have some, some uh, if you have exclusions, you don't like one-sided connections. Uh, if that's something that you just believe in strongly, please uh, uh, please communicate that on your design drawings. And the connection designer really should not make accept, uh, assumptions about the connection loads beyond what's in, indicated on the design drawings. If you run into a trip in the design rules that the engineer has provided then an RFI needs to be released. We should not be assuming um, what, the, what that connection needs to be good for. And then finally, keep in mind uh, that when the, when the engineer of record are reviewing a connection designer's um, uh, design, that I would say 50% of the connections that a connection designer designs is something that you will not find in the AISC manual. You won't find it in the design examples manual that AISC produces. Um, they're usually one-offs and, and, and custom. And so the engineer has to keep in mind that the, the manual and design guides are not the last word. Uh, there are uh, the manual and design guides shows one acceptable way of approaching a design. And so keep an open mind when you're looking at a, a particular connection design. Uh, it just, um, you know, uh, it's not the last word. So, and in fact, if you take a look at the preface in the AIC Design Examples version 14.0, there's some discussion in the preface that, uh, that actually talks about that now, which basically says that the examples are not intended to, to suggest that the approach presented is the only, only approach. So keep that in mind. Um, remember that this really is a team effort. Uh, I know that this was not a comprehensive uh, discussion on uh, effective communication. Like I said, it really did scratch the surface. Um, so this is the last slide. You'll see that there is a series of summary slides that follow that I'm not going to discuss. I just put those in there uh, for your benefit if you wanted to read through them. And so at this point, Brent, um, I'll turn it over, and uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than glad to, to address those. Okay. Thank you very much, Pat. We do have a few questions here. Right. Um, I am going to move us to slide 65. So this is uh, under your topic of being clear about specifications and standards. Um, okay. In this example, you uh, the second sentence there, Uh, right here, all loads provided on the drawings are factored ASD loads. The yeah. question is, um, factored ASD loads are not service loads. So does that mean the connection designer should use LRFD? Uh, no, it does not. Um, all it means is that um, both ASD load combinations and LRFD load combinations exist. Um, service loads are either brought into ASD load combinations or LRFD load combinations. Um, so uh, to me, an unfactored load means that it's a dead load or a live load that's been calculated using ASCE 7 and still needs to be brought into an ASD load combination to get a factored design load. So that's what I mean by that. So there is such a thing as an unfactored ASD load. Okay. Does that, does that answer the question? I, I believe so. Okay. Uh, we have a couple questions regarding slip critical. Um, okay. The comment is, uh, would you care to comment on the need 
uh, whether or not this slip critical is required. And the general comment is that per AISC, slip critical is rarely required in building design. Do you agree with that? Um, I don't know what I, whether I would say I want to agree or disagree with that. Let, let me let me let me make this statement here, in that um, in the RCSC and I believe also in AISC, they define where slip critical connections should be should be required. And I won't go through the list, but it, you know it's uh, you know basically you know where where you have dynamic effects and these kind of things. Um, However, as far as a, you know, if there's a serviceability concern or some concern um, about slip, uh, again, only the SEOR is going to know that. And if for some reason they feel like a slip critical connection is required, then that should be communicated. Um, my experience um, working in a consulting engineering firm is that very rarely are slip critical connections required. Uh, so the only thing I can I can I can really think to say is that uh, if you want slip critical connections, that should be clearly stated on the drawings. Okay. I, I, I will add something to that. That uh, me personally, if um, if I see a note, if I'm reviewing drawings where slip critical connections are required, I will generally try to get a hold of the engineer to talk to him uh, to find out why the slip critical connections are required. Uh, to see if um, there's some way that that can that requirement can be removed because that has a significant impact on the cost of the connections as well as the size of the connections. Okay, and then uh, on the same topic of of SC connections, what is the benefit of pretensioning bolts in a moment connections if the bolts are not slip critical? Well, slip critical really is just a bolt value, right? And we don't. There's there's no such thing as a slip critical bolt. It's uh, it's just the it's the uh, it's the value for which the uh, the bolt is assigned a an available shear strain. So, uh, Brent, let me make sure I understand this. The the question is, what is the value of pretensioning a bolt if it's not designed as slip critical? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I think the value of that is that it does provide some slip resistance, and in fact, most uh, most fang surface that you get uh, in uh, in just general fabrication gives you a class B uh, and um, I'm sorry, a class A surface. And uh, so, when you pretension them, you do get some you, you do get some uh, slip resistance. But at the same time, the connection is being designed as a bearing bolt value so that um, it reduces the, the overall size of the connection. And in fact, once the connection slips, it's, um, it's, it's the bearing that uh, it's going to control once the slip occurs anyway. Okay. But again, the, uh, the requirement to whether or not that, that really needs to be a, a slip critical connection is uh, something that needs to be answered by the SEOR. And okay. also, there's a very good definition of what a, what a, what's considered a pretension connection in RCSC. So I would I would advise the, the questioner to to uh, investigate that in the RC, RCSC. Okay. Um, here's a question about providing uh, load load information or reactions on on drawings. Okay. Why why should it be that the fabricator needs to look up reaction values? Why can't the EO, why shouldn't the EO, EOR be required to provide reactions? This appears to be passing the work on to the fabricator. Well, uh, clearly a question asked by a connection designer. Um, That, that's really tough to answer. You know, the code of standard practice re requires the engineer of record to communicate the design loads uh, so that an accurate and economical connection can be uh, can be provided. Um, nowhere in the code of standard practice, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, do they even talk about these UDL loads. Um, so, with that in mind, if the engineer is going to specify just design the connections for UDL. Um, then I believe that the engineer of record could very easily 
develop a table for the beam sizes and beam spans that he has on that pro he or she has on that project, and put a table together of what those UDL loads are uh, that they've taken out of three uh, three six. So. Um, I can't tell you why AISC doesn't address that Dakota standard practice that if the engineer wants to use UDL, UDL loads, they should provide a table for what those UDL loads are. Uh, but on the other hand, I can, you know, I can tell you that um, it doesn't take very long to look up a UDL load. So I, 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 you know, I'm probably going to make some enemies with some, with some fellow fabricators here, but I, I really don't uh, find it uh, burdensome to, to look up a UDL load. Okay. Um, here's a question um, from a connection designer. When requested by the SEOR to sign and seal shop drawings, can the connection designer refuse to sign and seal those shop drawings that reflect only the SEOR's design? Um, it sounds sounds like there's something lost in translation there. So what I'm going to do is, is um, restate the question and then ask if we can't verify that the, that this is the question. And basically, the question I think is. Uh, when a connection designer is asked to sign and seal shop drawings, they only sign and seal the shop drawings that are indicative of the connections for which they were responsible for the design, and do not sign and seal shop drawings um, uh, that are uh, particular to a engineer mandated connection. Is there any way we can get clarification that my restatement of that is, is the question that was being asked? Uh, just give me one moment. Yeah, that's correct. Your interpretation is correct. Okay. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of connection designers um, assume that when they sign and seal the shop drawings, that they're signing and sealing that the design of that connection is adequate for the loads required, and in addition. Are um, are reflective of the the way the the design was carried out. So in other words, it actually got detailed uh, properly based on on the on the design. So if I'm going to write a letter, and usually we don't sign and seal every shop drawing. What we do is we take a particular block or sequence of shop drawings, and then we'll put a cover letter on that with a list of all the shop drawings associated with the seal. Right, and then that seal is reflective that the that the shop drawings um, uh, associated with the with this particular letter reflect the design calculations uh, that the connection designer has performed. And so, an engineer, a connection designer, is not going to sign and seal a shop drawing uh, stating that the connection design was done properly if they weren't the ones that did the connection design. Now if that, and, and, that sound, and that's reasonable. Uh, but I have, been, I have been asked in the past to write a letter that says that, that not that the, to sign and seal the shop drawing, not that the connection is adequate to transfer the loads, but just that the shop drawing is reflective of the engineer mandated detail that was provided on the design drawings. And in that case, uh, I'm willing to I'm willing to sign and seal that shop drawing as long as my letter is clear about exactly what responsibility I'm taking on with with affixing that seal. And so I think that the, that the connection designer or fabricator just needs to be clear in their letter about the responsibility uh, that they're taking on when they affix that seal. That's the end of my answer. Okay. Um, here's a here's here's more of a comment that um, I think someone uh, they're looking for your 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 comments on it as well. I, I know in those last few slides uh, you talked about the SUR can I expect to shift full responsibility of the connection design on the connection designer. Mm -hmm. But the comment that came in was this: the SUR is usually not experienced in connection design, especially complicated ones. So the revision most of the time is a, or the review most of the time is a cursory review. 
we believe it is the responsibility of the fabricator, not the SCOR, uh, to understand these connections. Can you comment on this? Okay. The uh, um, I got to be careful how I respond to that. Um, so I, I'm going to I'm going to limit my response to um, the fact that this is really a legal issue. The the response the ultimate legal responsibility uh, for the integrity of that connection to resist the the required loads um, is. Um, is going to be a shared responsibility. Um, now, the legal counsel for so the Steel Company has advised me that that, that there you know you, there's really no answering that question until you, something something collapses and you and you get into a court of law, whether it's a jury or or or, or, or by judge, and have them decide who really is who really has how much responsibility, what was been done here, and, um, and it's going to be something that's, uh, that's looked at case by case. Now, another firm's uh, legal counsel uh, may have a different view or different advice for that. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't talk intelligently about that because I'm not a lawyer, um, but I can tell you that I believe, uh, I believe that, uh, that the SEOR and the uh, and the connection designer sharing that responsibility, and then I'll, I'll end this con this uh, question or response with one final comment. When a connection designer or a fabricator's engineer produces a set of calculations and then signs and seals that and sends it to the engineer of record for review, does that set of does that set of calculations go to the building department? In other words. Uh, the drawings that go to the building department for approval that get your occupancy permits or your building permits or whatever, uh, does the connection design actually go to the building department or is, it, or, or is it just those design drawings? And then as far as the authority having jurisdiction, they're assuming or, or believing that the engineer of record has full responsibility of those connections, uh, of the entire structure, and not just the mainframe design but of the connections. Um, and it, uh, so I'm going I'm to leave it at that. It's a, it really is a legal question, and every time I give this presentation, this, co this, type, of, this type of questioning opens up, and um, there's really no way of answering that until, until something collapses and we find out what, what a judge thinks. Okay. All right, and then um, here's another question. Is it standard practice for the SEOR to provide load tables requiring the fabricator to analyze different load cases to determine the reaction value. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. That is a great question. Uh, here's the here's the way I look at this. Um, connection designers and fabricators are on the strength side of of this equation, uh, and in my opinion, uh, should never be on the demand side. And so once the, once the engineer of record starts asking us to evaluate load combinations, um, that puts the connection designer on the demand side where they should never be. Uh, the connection designer should be on the strength side. So the EOR uh, should not be asking the connection designer to evaluate load combinations. Um, I'm not saying that it's never been done. Uh, but it's something that really shouldn't be done. We should be on the strength side. And I'll get just just a, a, a good example is, you know, if if you take a look at, at what is it, uh, equations uh, equations uh, three through seven, I believe, uh, has a load factor for the live load uh, that could either be 0.5 or 1.0, depending on whether or not the the live the floor live load is. Uh, larger than or less than 100 pounds per square foot. So, if we're to evaluate 
if the connection designer is to evaluate load combinations, how do we make the decision whether or not the, the floor live load was less than or larger than 100 pounds per square foot? Is the engineer of record going to actually provide a, a set of floor plans for every floor that is hatched and shows what regions the, uh, the floor load is, the, live, the floor, load, floor live load uh, is larger or less than 100? Um, rarely that's ever going to happen. Um, so, but that, that's just an example. But I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to take the hard line and say that connection designers should always be on the strength side of the equation. All right. Thank you very much, Pat. Well done.